together to worship our great God and Savior on this third Sunday in Advent. Today we're going to be taking a look at how Jesus comes and he dispels despair. He dispels despair in our lives. So uh, thank you for worshiping with us. Please stand and we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord God, for drawing us together to worship you, the true and the living God. Come, Lord Jesus, Come into our hearts, come into our minds. Lord God, change our view of life and may we conform to the image of Jesus, our Savior. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading comes from the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at the 18th verse. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of the disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. 
The poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the gospel of our Lord, and praise to you, O Christ. Let's have a time of prayer together. Again, you can send your prayer request in to Pastor B. Spang at Comcast.net. Pastor B is in boys, Spang, S P A N G, at Comcast.net. And let's go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord God, for your provision for us. We thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness <clears throat> that you are who you say you are, even in the midst of our own struggles, as John the Baptist struggled and questioned things in prison. You didn't get mad at him. You just pointed him back to what you do, who you are. And so, Lord God, may we look to you always for uh, giving us strength and assurance in this life, no matter what season we're going through in this life. I want to pray for those who are hurting right now. I pray, Lord God, that your hand of blessing would be upon them. If there's anybody right now that is experiencing uh, just anxiety or depression or uh, health issues in other ways, Lord God, that your hand of, of mercy and healing would be upon them. Lord God, we cry out to you on their behalf and ask that you would touch them. We pray, Lord God, for this ongoing pandemic that we're facing. We pray for safety for people. We pray, Lord God, for wisdom and guidance for those who are in leadership positions, uh, those who are in government officials, those who are health, who are healthcare workers. Uh, Lord God, give to them wisdom and guidance. Lord God, may this virus be squashed. Uh, we pray for the many who will be traveling in the coming weeks for Christmas and uh, just visit family and friends and pray that you would watch over them and keep them in your care. We pray, Lord God, by the power of your spirit that you would uh, put on our hearts and our mind opportunities to in, in, invite people to check out Jesus during this season of Christmas. Lord God, that people would be drawn to you, that drawn to you, that there would be revival that breaks out and comes to this community. Uh, and to whatever community people are listening from. So we lift these things before you, entrusting everything to Jesus who loves us with an everlasting love. We pray in his mighty name as he's taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
good morning to all of you. Uh, we're going to be uh, taking a look at our gospel reading from Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 28. And this is a section where um, John the Baptist is in prison, and he's got some questions for Jesus. So we want to take a look at this, and our theme during this Advent season is Come, Lord Jesus. Today it's Come, Lord Jesus, Dispel Despair. Let's pray. Gracious Father, open our hearts and minds to you now. We're thankful for your word. Your word is true and certain, uh, applicable to our lives here today. So as we dig into your word, we pray that by the power of your spirit that you would transform us, uh, help us to look to you for uh, wisdom, guidance, strength, and trust in our life, Lord God, that we trust in you fully and completely. So, Lord, we thank you for this time together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'll tell you a story of what happened back in uh, 1994. In 1994, the CEOs of seven major American ta tobacco companies testified before Congress, swearing under oath that nicotine was not addictive. Well, soon after, there was a man by the name of Jeffrey Wigand, uh, a former vice president for research and development at the Brown and Williams Williamson Tobacco Company, he sat down for an explosive interview with Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. So initially, the network did not air that interview uh, fear, for fear of breaching uh, Wigan's confidentiality agreement with his employer and the multi-million dollar lawsuit that could ensue. But soon after that, the Wall Street Journal reported Wigan's story, and then CBS did air the interview in which Wigan told Wallace that his company knowingly doctored the nicotine contents in its cigarettes to enhance the addictive qualities. Wigan was eventually sued by his former employer for breaching their co the confidentiality agreement. But the suit was dismissed by the courts in 1997 as a condition of the $368 billion settlement uh, that the tobacco industry had to make for uh, their lying to the federal government. Wigan is what is called, in modern day terms, a whistleblower, right? So he's telling you about something that was going on, that even, even with supposed protection for whistleblowers, many times whistleblowers face a difficult life and even jail for uh, revealing misdeeds that are occurring. Well, John the Baptist was a whistleblower in ancient times. Slightly different in the way he blew the whistle. He didn't so much reveal what was being hidden, but he actually confronted what was being done in the open that other people were afraid to con confront. You see, Herod took his brother's wife as his own wife. Obviously not cool and against the will of God. So nobody else had the nerve to blow the whistle on this scandalous behavior by King Herod. John, however, did, uh, did, and you know what it cost him? He wound up being in prison. So here's the prophet of God who was supposed to be the, preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. He's languishing away in prison now. It wasn't that long ago that people were streaming out to hear John the Baptist preach out in the wilderness on the banks of the Jordan River. And he was preaching a, 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 a message of repentance and a baptism for repentance. Yet none of that was happening now. It wasn't taking place. Instead, he got to stare at four cold walls in a prison cell. So when John followers go to visit him in prison and report about things that Jesus is doing, John the Baptist is having second thoughts. 
uh, that at one point it was crystal clear in his mind what his purpose was in life, what he was here for. And I'm sure his mother Elizabeth, uh, when uh, had relayed to him the events that took place in her life and what a special child he was, because you see, when Elizabeth in her old age was six months pregnant with John the Baptist, Mary, her cousin, her relative, came and visited Elizabeth. And Mary was just pregnant with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So she was early on in her pregnancy. Elizabeth is six months in her pregnancy. And when Mary comes, the baby, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb in excitement about uh, the mother of her, of his God coming to visit her. Um, but now, but now, you know, after Elizabeth is telling John, hey, you're a special child. You're sent by God to herald the coming of the Messiah. You're a special child. But now, now what? Now, in prison, life hadn't gone as he envisioned. So he sends his disciples back to Jesus. And he wants to know, are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? I'm sitting here in prison. Are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? There comes a time in every person's life where that question is going to thrust itself to the forefront. Jesus, are you really the one? Are you really the one? Is there someone or something else that I should be looking for in this life? Maybe that time comes at a moment of crisis in your life. Uh, you thought that your life would be different. You, you thought that following Jesus would have spared you from the cancer diagnosis. Would mean that your family life wouldn't be in the shambles that it's in right now. Or that your career would be more exciting and more fulfilling than it turned out to be. Maybe that question creeps in when your parents having made you to go to church all those years. And your friends seem to be doing just fine without going to church, with all that churchy stuff in their life. Jesus, are you really the one? Why am I here? Here's what I want you to know. Jesus isn't afraid of that question not afraid of that question. He isn't afraid of you wrestling with things. When John's disciples ask Jesus, they go back to Jesus and they ask the question that John wanted to know. He says, are you the one who's to come? They're talking to Jesus. Are you the one who's to come? Or should we look for another? Jesus doesn't snap at them and say, how dare you ask me that question? How dare you question me? the creator of the universe. Jesus is well aware of the doubts that we can have, and he's patient with us. He would prefer that we ask and wrestle with these questions and the doubts that might spring up than have apathy. You know, he can't really do anything with apathy, so questions and, and doubts he can work with. Apathy, can't really do anything with. So I encourage you, if you have questions, if you have doubts, wrestle with them. Take them to Jesus. Take them to somebody, uh, a, a faithful Christian, that can help you and walk alongside of you with these questions. That's what we're here for. for. But to just have apathy, to like not even care, Jesus can't really work with that. 
Jesus' response to their questions is an interesting one. He, said, he doesn't say, yes, I'm the one. He simply says, go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. Examine my life. So he says this, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear and the dead are raised. Up and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. He invites John to consider what he's doing. What is Jesus doing? That, that's good advice for all of us in the doubts and the questions when they arise. When those questions and those doubts assail, look at Jesus. Jesus invites us to look at his life, look at the way he lived, look at his death, look, look at his resurrection, look at what he's done. He ends with saying, blessed is this one who is not offended by me. That's a kind of a funny way to end when he's talking about, hey, you know, look at all these things. Why would anyone be offended by blind people receiving their sight, by the lame walking, by lepers being cleansed, by deaf people receiving healing, and the dead raised to life, and good news preached to the poor. Why would we be offended by that? Well, if you have the view that those people were in that state because they had done something wrong and they deserved it, and that you feel that you have done all good things in your life and, and, and the good things that you have in your life right now is because you earned it and you deserved it, well then, yes, you will be offended by Jesus. The offense, the offense of Jesus is that he brings a message that says none of you are really better than anyone else. We are offended by Jesus that our goodness doesn't count more than the other person's badness that we like to point out. The reality is that for many people it is not their sin that is keeping them from God, it is their goodness that is keeping them from God. The gospel and therefore Jesus is offensive to our goodness. John had doubts. Bad things had come into his life. They were happening to him now. Are you the one, Jesus? Jesus invites John and he invites you and I to look at his life. How did he live? How did he die? Is he a dead or a living savior? Examine his life. Examine his death. Examine his resurrection. Jesus goes on to say about John, who has doubts while languishing in prison. He says this, what then did you go out to see? A prophet, yes, and I tell you more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I tell you among those born of woman, woman none is greater than John. Wow. Stop and ponder that for a moment. A questioner of Jesus, a person who has doubts, commend, commended by Jesus, actually pointed out and commended by Jesus. Jesus is not defensive about your questions or your doubts that creep in. He says, John's a great man. He's a great prophet. What grace. Think of how easily we are offended when people doubt us. How easily I'm offended. How easily you may be offended when, you, when somebody doubts, who, you know, doubts your word, doubts who you are. Yet Jesus says, John's a, John is a great person, greatly esteemed. He, John doubted him. He says, this is a great person. He's greatly esteemed. His doubt didn't throw Jesus into a, a defensive tizzy. Do you have, and do I have, and do we have collectively a kind of a church culture where people can wrestle with questions, wrestle with doubts, 
and we lovingly point them again and again to the life of Jesus, walking alongside of them as they wrestle with things. Jesus finishes this dialogue about John with something that is beautiful for all of us to remember. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. He's not saying that John isn't a part of the kingdom of God. John is. He is a part of the kingdom of God. What he is saying is that although John was a great prophet and a great man, that is nothing compared to being part of the kingdom of God. John would eventually be beheaded after languishing in that prison cell. King Herod could separate his head from his body, but he could never take away from the love that God has for John in and through Jesus Christ. He could never separate him from the kingdom of heaven for all of eternity. That was his because God has promised that. So you and I can also rejoice in the midst of our trials, in the midst of despair that can creep in, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us in and through Jesus Christ. He comes into the deepest, darkest times and he dispels despair in our life. He's not shocked by our questions at those times. He is not shocked by our doubts at those times, but he invites us to meditate on his life, remember who he is and how much he loves us and what he did for us. That it will not fail. Come, Lord Jesus, dispel despair as we remember your life, as we remember your deeds, as we remember your death, for us on the cross as we remember your resurrection. You are the living God who has come to us and loves us and that we are yours and we are a part of your kingdom. Come, Lord Jesus, dispel despair. Father God, thank you for the gift of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fill us now with your spirit, Lord God. Lead us and guide us. May we be a, a, a place where, at a church community, where people can wrestle with things. We can walk alongside of them as they wrestle with these questions. And Lord God, that we constantly are pointing people to the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, who has accomplished everything, that we can have a relationship with you. We can have life and have it abundantly in and through you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let us confess together our faith in the triune God and all he has done for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and, and a life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. We're going to have a, a time of confession before the Lord. And the Lord knows what's really on our heart. But what he's inviting us to do is come before him. Be honest before him. Come into his presence. Uh, don't hide anything from him. Run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God. We should run towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from the words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ.
So Lord, let us confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this day. And again, I just want to encourage you to be open to the leading and guiding of the Spirit, to be able to, to invite people to check out Jesus. Who is this Jesus that is taught him as a babe in the manger? So uh, invite people to, to worship services, wherever you're at, and um, invite people to check out Jesus, to walk with them, and to, to uh, wrestle with them with the questions that they may have. Uh, so as you go forth uh, and live out your day and the week to come, Know that you're not alone, that God is with you, and he loves you with an everlasting love. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>